All right, Doug, I have a great commercial for you to watch. Let me share my screen here. One second. Um, that should be it. Okay, hopefully the sound will come through for you. If you don't hear the sound, please let me know. Today I have a presentation on dynasties. I refuse to talk about the ancient history and drama. That's just the patriarchy. Instead, I'm going to talk about a dynasty that I actually look up to. An all-women dynasty. Women of color. Gay women. Women who fight for social justice. Women with the jump shot. A dynasty that makes your favorite men's basketball, football, and baseball teams look like amateurs. A dynasty with fire breaks. A dynasty with sick style. A dynasty with crazy dimes. A dynasty that makes Alex and great look like Alex and be okay. But the dynasty that's been reigning for the past 25 years, undefeated since 1996. The USA basketball women's national team, seven time consecutive gold medalist. And most importantly, Women that made it possible for girls like me to feel like they can be a part of whatever dynasty they want. The greatest dynasty ever. Hmm. Well, not very grounded in reality. Just a minute. <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna move to a new location. Yeah. Or I should say the old location. I'm gonna return to the old location. So not grounded in reality. I think that's a that's a very that's a fair statement. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is actually. Uh, kind of a generous first uh, initial response, I think though as well. I try not to go <clears throat> overboard and and reacting about these things actually. But um of course, this, uh, this thing is uh, reminiscent of the uh, infamous Gillette commercial from, um, God, it must be a couple of years ago now. Yeah. Almost so long ago, actually, that it seems like ancient history at this point. I mean, a lot of people probably can't even recall it, even though it was pretty controversial at the time. Yeah, and, and it was very daring at the time, of course, Daring and, and disgusting, I've got to say, and and costly, I think, for their business. Yeah, it did, but they they probably they probably recovered from that because this was Nike that uh, put this one we just watched up. That's right. Well, obviously, they've calculated what happened with Gillette, and they figure that you know this is this is being ingrained as as part of the culture at, at this point. Alexander the Great. Great. Alexander's just, I mean, what, what is she talking about? Is she just kind of, you know, like juking and jiving? Okay, all right, that, that's fine if you just, but she probably doesn't even know who Alexander the Great was. No, I suspect not. I suspect not. But it's also, I mean, you know, uh, you know, the last time there was big hype made around a, uh, a professional, women's team, you know, as being like iconic and incredibly great. You know, they, uh, there was a, as was the, so with the soccer team and, uh, you know, then they played a, uh, high school boys league and, um, got whooped badly by them. Right. You know, right. Uh, you know, I just, I just wonder if whoever the high school championship team is in, uh, in the U S right now, boys team, you know, I mean, I mean, it's just, they could probably beat them. They could probably beat them. The only thing that was really interesting about women's soccer, at least as I recall, was that year that Brandy Chastain uh, took her blouse off mm -hmm. when, after she kicked the winning field goal or something like that. Yes, and saw her sports bra. Yeah, exactly. Now I thought, okay, that's that's kind of fun and interesting and uh, and entertaining, but... But otherwise, if you want speed and power and everything else, you've got to watch the men's soccer, quite frankly. That's right. And I don't understand why, why in order for uh, to appreciate women in things, like appreciate women's sports, why you have to shit on everything else, including going all the way back to Alexander the Great. The only way that you can really appreciate this uh, women's 
you know, uh, Olympic basketball team is by shitting on everyone else out there. And I just don't like it's it just shows the hollowness, I think, of the claim uh, on its face. The fact that you have you, you shouldn't have to talk about down about others in order if you really are that great. Well, these it, it, it's part of the denigration of, uh, and I th- I think denigration is a word that's being purged from the vocabulary because it sounds too much like uh, another politically incorrect word that begins with N. But uh, the politically, but the denigration of Western civilization generally, and um, these these idiots don't realize that if it wasn't for Western civilization, I mean, women would be treated as is basically house chattels, which which they are in most parts of the world. I mean, it's the most Western countries where women are equal, or actually more equal than men. And every, everywhere else, they're, they're they're nothing, you know, or or less than nothing. So it's the whole the whole thing is upside down. And I think it, I think these people are just they're indoctrinated, but they're ignorant. In yeah. addition to being indoctrinated, it's and it's still it's still it, it's not just going on. Still, it's accelerating, as as that commercial showed. Yeah, and I think that I think what people don't realize, like I get the whole idea. I mean, I have a daughter. I want that daughter. I want my daughter to feel good about herself, to have you know faith in herself that she can tackle the world like head on. You know that there isn't uh, that she's not going to be just the same as I do for my son. I, I mean, I want that. I definitely, definitely want that. So I understand the whole inclination of our culture to go to talk about girl power you know i really as it having a daughter i really do understand that like the desire to do that but at the same time i think they don't understand how it's only it's they're not thinking of the second order consequences of this i mean they're basically the truth is is that no one knows nobody knows about the last who you know with the last olympic women's basketball team i don't know which who the last olympic men's basketball team was no one knows who they are it's not part of our history or traditions or anything and and so to hold up that organization as being and you know as being the most important thing ever and we're definitely fighting social justice etc cetera, etc cetera, you actually deny people any kind of reasonable cultural identity that they could have that they could really build self-esteem on, that they could really do something with. You know what I mean? Does that make sense at all? Yeah, it does. But, but you know, that reminds me of something else, the Olympics, all right? So why are the Olympics so nation-oriented? I mean, listen, I think it's wonderful that you get the best athletes in the world that are competing against each other, okay? But uh, it's like the Russians weren't allowed to compete as Russia this year. So they had to they had to wear red, white, and blue, which are their national colors too, but arranged in a different pattern and, and there, all kinds of strange things. It was abbreviated ROC, Russian Olympic Committee. Right. Russia, they ought to be called ROC. Yeah. But why do we compete as nationalities? I mean... I, you should be able to, I think you ought to be able to complete, compete on any basis that you want. For instance, if Chicago wanted to put up a basketball team and they could qualify for the International Olympics, why shouldn't it just be Chicago as opposed mm-hmm. to the U.S. if that's what they wanted to do, depending on who wants to be on the team and who's financing it? I mean, it's uh, the boundaries of all these countries are are very arbitrary and the governments use it to ramp up uh, nationalism and jingoism actually uh, among their citizens. That's right, it certainly does. And I think, I mean, I even noticed and I was watching some track and field uh, portion of the Olympics and uh, one of the competitors was from South Sudan. And I just saw the the, the acronym or the uh, the abbreviation of the country and the, and the flag and I didn't recognize it. I'm trying to figure out who it was. And, um, you know, it was ended up being South Sudan, which I didn't even understand was actually fully recognized by Sudan, at least, but whatever, um, you know, I think it is used as a way to unite, you know, to say that it's our guys, you know, it's our people, you know, beating your people and it and making, turning it into a nationalist thing that is so important. 
Yeah, exactly. And, and there's one other thing that I'd mentioned. I think the reason that the Russians were excluded this year is because it's alleged, I don't know if it's true or not, that the uh, Russian government had a policy of using performance enhancing drugs to help their athletes. I don't know if it's true or not. I mean, you can't really be sure what's true in almost any regard in today's world. But here's the thing, why not have an open class and a normal class so that if there's somebody out there that wants to take drugs and do fantastic things, well, that's fine. Let them run in the open class. It's like, you know, when you're racing cars, you can you can race a, a standard Porsche or you can have an open class, a double A fuel dragster. Right. Run those. So it'd be a lot more entertaining too. Yes, it would. And people might say, well, it's risky. They might hurt themselves. Well, safety is entirely too much of a big deal in today's society anyway. So yeah, be all that you can be, I say. Take some risks. Yeah, and I mean, let's be honest, these a lot of these athletes, you know, are uh, you know, they they take risks anyway. I mean, in the training and the priority, you know, prioritizing achievement over all other things. I mean, there are naturally going to be risks involved with it. And you got to imagine that uh, you got to imagine that the top levels of all these things that they're, you know, that they're trying to cheat around, they're cheating around the corners anyway, you know, um, no matter what. I, I would have to imagine. I mean, if you think about the during the Tour de France and, you know, Lance Armstrong's doping scandal. In that case, if I recall, what he was doing was he was actually just re-injecting himself with his own blood that was withdrawn from his body when he was at higher altitude. And that was considered, you know, like drug use. Even, yeah, even. And, and isn't it cheating if, if you're uh, an athlete that, you know, trains at 8,000 feet and then comes down to sea level? Sure ought to be. Yeah, you're going to do better. But, but that's not cheating, is it? Yeah. I mean, it's... It's also, it's also arbitrary and also political. And of course, sports themselves have become highly political. And, you know, frankly, I've never really taken much interest in professional sports. Like, why would I care if New York's gladiators beat Chicago's or LA's gladiators? Unless I have money on the game, I don't have any skin in the thing because these guys transfer from one city to another, or for that matter, I could move from one city to another. So why should I have an allegiance to a, to a, to a team like that? Not only that, they have allegiance to teams that the players don't even have allegiance to. So the teams that the players swap up randomly all the time. And then yeah. uh, but you, you still are like pro whoever's wearing your color. It's, it's totally absurd. It's all phony and make believe. So, well, like so much of, everything in, in, in today's world. But yeah, that was a pretty disgusting ad on the part of Nike. And, uh, you know, just another indication of how degraded things are getting from a cultural point of view. Yeah, maybe they're just trying to distract us from the uh, the allegations of slave labor in China, you know, like this is, uh, it's, this is such a lightning, this is such a, you know, these ads stir up so many emotions in people that they forget about the fact they're distracting them from the, you know, the, the Uyghur camps, you know, that are making their shoes in China. Anyway, I guess it's okay if uh, when we're in Afghanistan or Syria, we kill hundreds of thousands. And I guess that's the number, but nobody knows because the reporting is not accurate of, of local uh, Mohammedans. But when the Chinese go into a province which is populated by people who are not ethnic on Chinese and are have a different religion which is antithetical to what the rest of the Chinese believe and they're treating them badly. Well, that's gone on throughout all of human history. It's unfortunate, but uh, they're really no different than we are. No, it's not, but it's, it's, a, it's bad PR for, for Nike. And I think that Nike they're pretty PR savvy. And I wouldn't, you know, and I, I, like, I wouldn't be surprised if something like this were done as a distraction because it really is. It's a, it's such a lightning rod and it's so simple that everybody can understand it. Whereas the situation, you know, with the Uyghurs is unclear and who knows exactly what's going on and there's not any clear evidence and it's just complicated, but you know, we'll just get everyone 
all caught up in this woke issue. But yeah. That's what it's, who knows? Yeah. But it's going to get worse before it gets better. So I guess we'll just have to monitor it and, and try to be amused to get something out of it. Yeah, the Alexander the Great thing was the thing that bothered me, though. The rest of it, I'm just like, you know, whatever. But like, <laughs> makes Alexander the Great look like Alexander the OK. <laughs> you know, it's so great. <laughs> so the other thing I wanted to talk to you about today was about financial independence. And um, the reason I thought that that was a worthwhile topic, I'm just reading this uh, biography on Voltaire right now. And it's clear that his financial independence was the key to him being one of the you know, most outspoken people of the Enlightenment era who took substantial risks to say what he thought, you know, was actually imprisoned in the Bastille twice because of it. Um, but, you know, and he managed to make a lot of money along the way through through a lot of means, actually, uh, his, as a playwright at first, but then actually figuring out a loophole in the, in the French lottery was a, a second part of it where he made a huge fortune in that. But the, the bottom line is, is that his financial independence gave him the freedom to say what he wanted, to think what he wanted and do what he wanted. And the whole reason I think that most of us pursue wealth or just at least financial dependence is just is, is so that we can be left alone, so we can not be bothered, so that we can be insulated from the, the nonsense of the world. And uh, I just want to get your thoughts on that. Like from a, I have this Voltaire example, but I mean, historically, are there others that come to mind where you think that was also true, first of all? And then how does it relate to today? Well, you know, throughout history, if you're poor, you've always been treated poorly. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you were a rich guy, you know, it's, it, it's funny. I was um, listening the other day to, a, um, to uh, Elizabeth Vanderveer, who's a very good classical scholar who did a course for the teaching company of which I'm a great fan in general. And uh, it was on uh, Odysseus and so forth. And one of the interesting things that she pointed out there was the Greek concept of xenia. It's uh, when, it's a little bit different than hospitality. It's when somebody presents themselves at your door, how you receive them and how you treat each other. And one of the points that she made there is that people of different economic statuses would run together. And we're talking about, you know, Homer wrote, you know, in uh, seven to 800 BC, but this was ingrained in Greek culture, obviously much before that. And uh, if you were a traveler, if you were a king, you would present yourself at the cat pal palace. And if you were, uh, you know, a wealthy merchant, you'd seek out a wealthy, another, because there were no hotels that you could stay at uh, or, or you could camp out. But, uh, you know, and if you were a beggar, you'd present yourself at the hovel of another beggar. And the custom of the country was that you'd both treat each other with what they called zinnia, hmm. uh, a kind of hospitality. Well, birds of a feather have always run together, okay? And if you control more wealth, you can expect to be treated better. And if you don't, I mean, you're gonna be treated like a, like a dog, mm. you know, quite frankly. This is a concerning thing though today. It's that uh, I, I wonder, uh, it's like with the great cultural revolution in China, uh, people that had wealth lost all their wealth. And then they, they dropped down the ladder of class many, many rungs. And I wonder if that couldn't happen here in the US where you lose all your wealth and you drop down many, many rungs down to the level of, well, like these people that are living in tents of which apparently there's a, a growing number all across the US, people camping in tents and cities and parks and things like that. Gee, they didn't expect to be living in tents. I mm. mean, when I guess a lot of these people went from having to store their extra junk in storage units to all that they own is something they can put in a tent. Things can happen pretty quickly. 
Well, yeah, I mean, you talk about the German Cultural Revolution. I mean, in fact, what they did is they, the, for, the, for the educated class especially, they would send them out into the countryside to learn how to uh, farm, right? I mean, they, they would degrade them or they degraded them. Yeah, they were trying to degrade them. Uh, certainly was part of it, but they, you know, they stripped them of everything they had and stripped them of the lifestyle and network that they had and, and sent them off to these villages where they were to be, uh, you know, where they were ruled by the illiterate, really. And yeah, I mean, I can certainly got to that extent. So it could, so it could happen again. And the same thing happened in Cambodia too. Uh, you know, 10, 15 years later, different country, slightly different time. The same thing happens. Some people get in control and they want to take down the high and the mighty. Hmm. I, I don't know if that's going to have application to where we are here in the U.S. or not. Certainly the U.S. as a, as a country is being taken down a step or two as we speak. I no mean, doubt. wasn't there an article recently, was it perhaps in Reason Magazine that pointed out that the US only 15 years ago was ranked number one from the point of view of personal and economic freedom. And now the, the same people had ranked it something like 11. That's in a very short period of time. Yeah, and I think, I guess my, I mean, certainly the tides can shift and, you know, uh, you know, wealth and status cannot totally insulate you from the, from the disasters of life. But I guess, you know, my, my main question around all this was, was the, the fact that historically they have provided you with one with options, you know, at least with some optionality, if they're, if they're like, if you're dependent upon a job, you know, that you, um, you can't leave for whatever reason, like, but this, this is your, your specialty or whatever you can, and it's in a specific geographic area. And, you know, you have uh, lots of debt that has to be serviced, then, you know, what you can do, you know, is with your life dramatically changes. I mean, you don't control your nine to five, of course, but you also don't control where you live. You don't control all kinds of factors, the people you associate with to a great degree and so forth. And, um, you know, but, you know, versus if you're in a situation where you're financially dependent, I think your your freedoms increase substantially with your with the with the decrease of your dependency. I guess is what I'm what I'm what I'm trying to suggest. Is that? Yeah, that makes all the sense in the world. And of course, at this point, uh, it's well known, and I believe it's a fact that about half of the country receives more from the federal government than they pay in taxes. Uh, that means they're really at the beck and call of the federal government. They have to support the federal government because that's where their sustenance comes from. And it's getting much, much worse with the uh, stimmy checks that have been mailed out and, yeah. and the trillions of dollars that have gone hither, hither and yon. It's making people increasingly feel that uh, the government is the fountainhead that everything comes out of. And they look to the government, it seems natural. I mean, that's where the money came from. And they hear on the news, the government's doing this or the government is uh, directing things this way or that way. And they think the government is like a magic entity of some type. Hmm. So this is, this is very bad because the government produces absolutely nothing. Right, well, the, I, I think that 50% uh, ben, net beneficiary number probably goes back to 2014 or 2013 or something like that. I mean, I think at the first time I heard that, once we crossed that threshold, it was like kind of like imagining crossing the you know a Rubicon of sorts, you know, where all of a sudden you know the 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 you know the public would easily be able to vote more and more largesse for itself, you know, once it crossed that number. But I can only imagine after the pandemic stuff that it's got to be vastly higher than that vastly higher from all the unemployment benefits that have been paid and continue to be paid to more. So, Yeah, and nobody wants to uh, abolish any of these agencies or, or STEMIs or anything because it's, it's going to change things for the worse for the people working for the agencies, the people that are getting goodies from them. So, of course, nobody wants to do that. And, and they raise, I don't see any way out of this uh, uh, at this point. Do you think, kind of as a separate uh, tangential topic to a degree, do you think that anybody who 
you know, we talk about news a lot and we talk about the fact that you, you never really know what's going on because you really can't trust the reporting. You don't know what's thoroughness, et cetera. Do you think that anyone who is not financially independent can even, can even be trusted anymore, you know, for what, what they're saying? Because they just have, it seems like everyone is always speaking in their best interest, you know, whether you're a, if you're on the, you know, if you're a CNN anchor or a Fox anchor, obviously, you know, who pays the bills. And that's essentially the advertisers who are trying to attract, who want to cater to your audience. Right. So like, can you really even believe that they believe the things that they're saying, whether they're true or not? I mean, they probably don't, whether they'd say it, whether they believe it or not, it seems. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. This is one of the big, one of the big problems of being greatly in debt. It's that you have to crack that nut every month, which means that you have to work every month to pay the debt and you can't afford to lose your job. And uh, th this, this really inhibits what you can say and what you can think. You don't dare lose your job because your whole style of life will fall apart. Kind of leads me to another thing. Actually, when people talk about my job or your job, Actually, it's not my job or your job. It's a job that I happen to be doing. People think they own their job and people shouldn't have a right to take it away from them. Well, I can understand it. Nobody wants their rice bowl broken, but uh, it's the wrong psychological attitude. It's not your job. It's your employer's job that he's making available. Hmm. And of course he can call the tune, but it's up to you to be in a position where if you don't like the tune he's calling, you can tell him to take the job and shove it. But that's not the position most people are in today because they have such serious obligations. Their student loans, their mortgages, their credit card debt. Uh, mm. Yeah, I, I wonder if that's why we see, as, you know, we have also on this podcast before lamented how the, la the lack of courage we see among people who are being attacked directly, you know, by, by, uh, you know, the lockdowns or whatever else, but people who are directly affected by it, seemingly rolling over, you know, every time uh, they're, they're like, they personally are attacked. And I guess if they are so dependent on the systems, if they are, if they, if they are so dependent, then I, then I guess they reason with themselves that it ought to, they ought to just sit down and shut up and just kind of like go with the flow or else things will get worse for them personally. Yeah, exactly. I'd, I'd better get along and, uh, and go along or I might be severely damaged. And the whole country is in that position now. We've gone a long way from the era of the uh, independent cowboy. Mm. I'd just ride on to the next town mm. after the job was done or whatever. Wouldn't this be a, a, an argument then for why the, the wealthy nations might actually be at far greater risk of becoming, you know, totalitarian in nature than, than, than others because of the fact those wealthy nations have, been, have essentially been able to make its citizenry fundamentally dependent upon it. Yes, all the wealthy nations of the world are highly financialized today where everybody is reliant upon the financial system. Not, you know, which is separated from actually producing real widgets, real goods and services. It's all about, it's all about the, the, the paper money, which is manipulated in value and amount and availability. So yeah, once you get everybody involved in this artificial financial system, uh, I think things become very, very sketchy. We've gone a long way from the era where the you know, the shoemaker makes shoes and gets money, saves the money, grows in wealth and so forth. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's all about speculating with Robin Hood or the equivalent today. It's, uh, or blogging, Doug. Don't forget about the bloggers. The there's bloggers. Plenty, there's plenty of bloggers out there too. Yeah. 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 Well, and information workers. I, well, we wouldn't be in a position to hold forth like this, unless we were both kind of uh, kind of well-to-do, quite frankly. So That's we're right. able to do and say what we want, because if we're deplatformed, 
it's not going to affect us at all financially. In fact, it would affect us favorably financially. There's the 90 minutes a day we spend during these things that we don't get paid for. We could use that time for something that produces something for us. Yeah. That's right. So, you know, money is a wonderful thing. And I pointed this out. I'm sure everybody's aware of this at this point. It's that uh, in the New Testament, uh, it said, you know, a lot of people think it says, uh, love of money is the root of all evil. Of course, that's not what it says in St. Paul. I'm not a fan of St. Paul, incidentally. But he says the love of money is the root of all evil. But he's wrong again, because money represents all the good things that you have and want to provide for others and want to do and so forth. So yeah, the love of money, insofar as it represents all these things, is a good thing. And people should have as much of it as they possibly can. In fact, and if you value freedom, and this is where I think a lot of libertarians have gone wrong, you know, they, they're very, you know, obsessed really with certain ideological positions that they'll argue, debate amongst themselves uh, endlessly. But I think as Ayn Rand said, you know, if you really want to be free, you need to be rich. Like you should be rich. You should try and be rich uh, or, or something along those lines. And I think that uh, you don't have to be super wealthy or, you know, we don't have to be a Bezos or anyone like that, but not being financially dependent on others, you know, or to be financially independent should be a priority for individuals. And I don't know, I don't know when that changed because I actually, I think even when I was growing up, it was still like, it was, it was definitely a big deal. Like it was, you were expected to be, you know, independent of your parents by the time you turned 18. It was basically like that day. It was like, we're going to give you a, we're going to give you a, a two week grace period, you know, until boot camp. You know what I mean? But it's like, you're done. Like you got to go. And I expected it and they expected it and it was fine. There was no hard feelings about it. Well, that was the way the world worked. And it was, it was seen as that's the way the world should work. And I think a couple of weeks ago, I must have mentioned some friends of mine in Aspen who have uh, who have some kids. They're well-to-do. Everybody in Aspen is well-to-do. But the kids want, they want, they want a um, kind of an annuity of $10,000 a month, plus, plus a suitable apartment to live in. And, you know, one of the parents was shocked at hearing that the kids had that kind of expectation. And one of the reasons for it is, well, all my friends have it. I mean, this, the culture has, <laughs> culture has changed uh, in a lot of ways, and not for the better. Yeah, no, this is, it's a big problem. And I, it's, it's a big problem, the, the lack of, uh, you know, the dependence on our, our parents. And then, of course, and if that transfers anywhere, it transfers to the government, I guess. You know, it's... Exactly. These kids don't want to be independent. They just want to be wealthy or well off. And they don't see any cause and effect of, well, let's see, how do you get that money? How do you get wealthy? You know, this is, of course, I blame it on the parents, but you can't just blame it on the parents. You got to blame it on the general society, the water that the fish are swimming in is polluted, quite frankly. Yeah, but and you can understand though why they think money is bad when they don't, they, they don't understand how wealth is created. Like they don't, they understand that basically, you know, you, you create something that didn't exist before and someone says, Hey, can I trade you some of this money for that? You know, and then you do that enough and you accumulate more money than you have, than you have the need for to trade for the goods for your survival. And like, that's, it's a, it's a measurement of at least in the pre super financialization world, you know, when we do live in a world where the financial system has distorted all kinds of things, but you know, in its purest form, you, you become rich, you become wealthy, you become financially independent by creating more value for others than you consume. And that's that simple. Yeah, of course, in those days, engineering was all about putting beams and electrons and stuff together in an actual engineering type of way. But today the world has become much more a, a, a milieu of financial engineering which is which is very different it's very different and corrupting it's deeply corrupting i think because you know it we've talked about this before with the financial system but um with with just one one time before we talked about bitcoin and i was saying the price rise in bitcoin makes me uh which i have benefited from tremendously 
makes me think, wow, did I waste my life uh, starting dozens of, or not dozens, let's say more than a dozen businesses that, you know, the toil and sweat and time and energy I traded in order to acquire financial independence is made kind of a laughing stock by the distortions in the markets that cause these speculative bubbles to occur, you know, and it's like, it, 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 so it's so distortive, which is why people are, you know, they do see Robin Hood as a way out. Yeah. And, and when money is something that's so ephemeral that can be materialized out of nothing, people don't have any respect for it. Mm. If you don't have any respect for something, that's got all kinds of consequences down the road. So mm. I'd like to think of something that's really good that's going on today that's going to turn things around. I'm looking for a, uh, I'm looking for a, a little flower that's growing out of this pile of dung that's going to, uh, you know, blossom and, and change things in the future. Is there, any, is there any such thing out there right now that's... Uh, Anything really positive that's happening right now? Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's new and maybe not everybody's noticing. I mean, if there is and we can put our finger on it, then it, it, it might be a fantastic investment opportunity or at least a speculative opportunity, if not an investment opportunity. Well, I mean, you know, we, we, I was just talking about cryptocurrencies. I still think that, you know, as a speculation, cryptocurrencies are still pretty tremendous. You know, you talked about gold stocks in particular, though gold got hammered over the weekend. It's very strange, actually, that selling into the, on a Sunday evening, it's very weird. Um, gold, gold, is, uh, gold stocks did not get hurt that much, maybe because they were already really cheap, which they have been for 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 several months now. But um, yeah, why did gold fluctuate that way? It hasn't changed any of my basic views. I mean, these you know ripples in the water can't, you can't get distracted by them. No, you can't. You can't. Um, the only way to not get distracted by them, though, is to not be over leveraged in any of them. Because if you're if you have too much capital committed to any one particular trade, and it goes wrong in a serious, you know, even even for a day, if it goes wrong in a big way for a day, it's very hard to um, to think properly about it. Yeah, if if you're over leveraged in gold and it drops a hundred dollars like it did over the weekend. I mean, you're really scared and you might do something irrational. Mm -hmm. But if it's just a small part of your portfolio, well, it's of interest and you'll pay attention, but it's not going to uh, upset your psychology and you're not going to act irrationally because of that alone. It's true. Well, let's see, the flower. You've got to, you know, more, more is better. I mean, it's like what Mae West said, I've been rich and I've been poor. Rich is better. And it's true, although rich brings obligations with it. You know, and, it, and rich doesn't necessarily make you happy. And I'll repeat again what, what somebody said so aptly, anybody that thinks money makes you happy has never had any. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the way I like to think about it is that, uh, you know, money solves 95% of the world's problems, of your problems that you'll experience in the world, but it can't do a damn thing about the other 5%. It has no effect whatsoever in the 5%, and it does create its own additional problems. I mean, I think we've, we've quoted Fight Club here saying, you know, the things you own eventually own you. You know, you have, you have more money, you have more stuff, you spend enormous amounts of energy, and time worrying about that stuff or taking care of that stuff or whatever. And it's... You know, it's better. It's better to have than not, of course. Yeah, of course, and it, it's it, it's a question of what's what's most important on your mind. Let's suppose that right now you have um, cancer and toothache and uh, a bad itch someplace. All right, what you're really concerned about is the cancer. If they cure the cancer. Well, now the most important thing in the world, forget about the cancer. I'm going to be concerned about the toothache. And then it's the itch. And then it's something else. It, it, it's, it's always something. It's just the nature of the world. Yeah, I think I, I don't know if this is a correct quote or not, but 
I've told you it before. Uh, Buddha says something like this. It says, everyone has precisely 83 problems. And the 83rd problem is the desire to not have problems. <laughs> that's, that's so true. Yeah. And I, it, it doesn't matter where you are. That's always the case, it seems to me. But I think, um, you know, having more money is better. But I think that the important element, important element coming back to Voltaire is, is the financial independence and the freedom of thought and action that comes from just financial independence. Like he ended up becoming tremendously wealthy um, through his life in great part because, you know, a huge part of it was this, was this, the, this, this French lottery related to their bonds. You probably know all, all about that, I'm sure. Um, but uh, you figured out that the, basically the economists didn't really know what the hell they were doing when they were trying to raise money. And uh, they kind of, uh, they, uh, anyway, they, they ended up making a fortune because of it. But, you know, him being, how different would some of the core ideas that he espoused during his lifetime, like how different would the world be if he didn't have the independence to be able to say and uh, whatever he wanted? I mean, you know, he was certainly had the balls to do it. He was, we went to the Bastille twice. I mean, he was willing to say it, but he, without some, if he, you know, what, you know, you can, you can, you can have the, the courage to speak out, uh, you know, when you, when you're opposing it, maybe a direct force, but I think it's much harder when you're thinking about when you live in a world of obligations, of debt, you know, of, of income needs, of all of those things. Um, I think it's really, really hard to find your courage to say what must be said, but you know, he managed to have it. Yeah, it really helps to have resources. If, if you have no resources, people will just brush you aside. But Voltaire had resources. He could, uh, he could afford when things got a little bit too hot in France to live across the border in Switzerland. And he couldn't have done that unless he put himself in a financial position. And of course, you know, money, is, uh, is the Catholic Church is fond of saying about some things, is an outward, I see it as an outward sign of inward grace. So that uh, if you're poor, you've got to ask yourself, well, why am I poor? What have I done wrong? Why have I failed to provide goods and services to other people that they're willing to trade me stuff for? And uh, I don't know. Do poor, maybe poor people hate money because they because it's it's like standing in front of them all the time saying you're a failure. You're a failure. You haven't dealt with me properly. But uh, the answer to the question is is to confront the problem. And uh, if you don't have any money, get some in, in, in a legitimate way. But it's important to have it. You you can't you, you can't be poor. Of course, it's all relative. It's like our friend. Bo Keeley. I mean, he's a hobo. He doesn't have any money, but he's a type of person that if he wanted money, yes, he could get it. So some of it's a matter of psychology too. Well, and what he is, is he's financially independent. He is independent. Nobody tells him what to do or where to go. To or think, what to say. Exactly. So he's a very free man. He's a much more free man than some salary man who's earning a couple hundred thousand a year and is burdened by obligations and you know has to say how high when his employer says jump. Right. So, true, it's not just a question of having money, although money is helpful. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, I mean, everything boils down to psychology, doesn't it? Or, or economics, I've heard, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is the rule of the world? One of the, uh, you know, I just, just cause we, were, we started this off with a woke commercial. I have to say that you know, your, your, uh, your thoughts on that. If someone is poor, they should looking themselves in the mirror and going, well, what have I done wrong? Because I must be doing something wrong in the era of woke, Doug, this is victim blaming. Oh, oh. well, perhaps it is. It's gotta be somebody else's fault. Am I right? Obviously, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Really? Yeah. yeah. Who, caused me to, who caused me to to be this way? Yeah, it's uh, and it, it, it's really quite sick. Yeah, it is. And I think, and the problem, one of the worst things about this whole identity politics, this woke ideology, is that it is so fundamentally disempowering to an individual. You know, it it like deprives them of a actual path 
to uh, improving themselves, you know, and it starts with looking at themselves and what they how they're contributing to their current station and how it might be changed. But you're not allowed to do that. It's a, like I said, victim shaming or victim blaming in the woke world. Yeah, I, I don't need to improve myself in order to improve my condition. What I need to do is apply for a grant from a government agency. That'll improve my condition instead. Yeah, or that uh, parental pension that uh, your friends or your friend's children are looking for. Yeah, where do these people get these ideas, frankly? <laughs> it's, it's crazy. All right. Well, that's all I really had for us to discuss today, Doug. Was there anything else on your mind you wanted to, you wanted to share with our viewers? No. Uh, there's so many things that are about to happen in the world today. Of course, people don't have, still don't have to pay rent or their mortgages. That's been put in a can has been kicked down the road a little bit further. Student loans as well, Doug. Uh, student loans have been delayed oh. until uh, 20, January 1st of 2022. Well, we'll have to look at, at some point, exactly what the consequences of that are going to be. What happens to these landlords that aren't getting their rent payments and the buildings that they have? And what's going to happen to the banks that aren't getting their mortgage payments? That's not a problem. The government will take care of them. Yeah. And uh, the $1.6 billion of student loans, exactly who is that owed to? And whose ox is going to be gored as mm -hmm. they're not paid? Frankly, I'm not sure. Hmm. Yeah, I'll have to look into that a little bit and find out. But clearly, it's going to. Might I, I, I suspect that with a lot of these things, they've you know it ends up in a Fannie or Freddie type situation. You know, it ends up being you know they're they're it's backstopped essentially by these pseudo government agencies. You know, just like the loans get swapped. I think the Fed owns most of the housing at this point. I think there's almost directly it's on their balance sheet now, but. Absolutely nothing wrong with this country that printing up a few trillion dollars more can't, can't cure. No question about it. Just the only problem we have, Doug, is it's just a failure of imagination. I mean, they just got to start. They just got to start sending bigger checks to everyone's home and it will all be fine. Yeah. All right. We'll leave it there then. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate it. See you tomorrow, Matt.